Hey, what's up, everybody? My name is John Hammond. So if you have been living under a rock for the past day and day and a half, yesterday, two days ago, uh, there is a new CVE, CVE 2021-3156 that affects all the versions of pseudo that we tend to know and use right now in the modern world. So sudo, right, the command that you use to run escalated commands or escalate your privileges and run a command as root or the super user, super user do sudo on Linux. Now it is a heap exploitation or a heap buffer overflow. And I don't particularly consider myself a guy that's pretty sharp or smart on binary exploitation or reverse engineering. But my good friend Caleb is. He's pretty sharp on that stuff. So I kind of wanted to pick his brain. I wanted to chat with him and I kind of wanted to get his hot take on what this thing is. So this video is showcasing that conversation with him. He's still kind of poking at it, tinkering with it, trying to follow in the steps of the Qualys researchers because Qualys, the company that released and found this information, found this bug and this flaw, they did not release exploit code with that or a proof of concept of POC. That's totally cool. That's totally understandable, right? It's probably a good move since there aren't a lot of patches rolled out already. This is kind of breaking news. And maybe we don't want to put that in potentially bad hands. But obviously, right, a lot of us red teamers, a lot of us security researchers are kind of curious and are kind of wondering, hey, can I play long? Can I look at this? Uh, can I get a POC or a POC just as well? Um, so Caleb's <laughs> off to the races and uh, we'll tune in with him maybe later, hopefully, if he gets a little bit more traction, but he's still kind of out of wall. Anyway, I wanted to put this out so maybe you could get a little bit of a bigger picture on what this thing is and you could learn a little bit more about it. So uh, before we dive in, I do want to maybe walk through how we could patch this thing. So I'll roll through some patching footage before we get into the video conversation with Caleb, but I'll try to include timestamps in the bottom of this or in the description of this video so you can kind of click around and navigate to what you might want to see. Anyway, let's get to it. Alrighty, so I am at my terminal. I'm over here in my temporary directory. And if I were to go ahead and run a command, I'll just run sudo tac tac version to see what version I'm running on. And I am currently running on 1.8.31. Now we know this version is affected by this bug, by this vulnerability, by the CVE. So it's kind of up to us. The onus is on us to go ahead and update. I'm more than positive this has already been rolled out to a lot of distribution repositories. I'm pretty sure Debian's got it, so Ubuntu's got it, Red Hat, CentOS, uh, Arch, obviously, anything that's kind of a rolling release, like, like on the bleeding edge, right? They've got this stuff already kind of locked in. But if you don't, or if you don't want to go work through the notion of getting it through the repositories, go grab it from the source. Go grab it from the pseudo main online official page. You can see that they do have this new current stable release, pseudo one. 0.9.5 p2 released on January 26, 2021. And this is the patched version. So that pseudo CVE will not take effect here. If you go up over to the download page, you can see they've got a tar gzip file that you can go ahead and download. I'll go ahead and copy that link and I'll hop back over here so I can run a wget and download this. Now this will take a little bit of time to run. It is, uh, you know, a decently sized package. Uh, I also apparently already have that in my current directory. So there is a dot one here. Forgive me. This is kind of just for the demonstration sake, but, uh, this is what I would recommend anyone go do if you want to patch. I've tweeted about this, so I'll include that little tweet here. Uh, you can go take a look at that. But now that that is downloaded, I can go ahead and ls, see that it is in my current directory, and I'll go ahead and tar extract it with x to extract, v for verbose, z because it's going to be a gzip or a gunzip file, and f to specify the file. I'll autocomplete that pseudo path here, and it'll go ahead and decompress, extract all of that. I can hop into that directory now, and I should have all the files necessary to build this from source and go ahead and install it on my own machine. So that command syntax is super simple. Just run dot slash configure to get your machine prepped and ready for it. And it'll take a little bit of time to go through, make sure you've got all the files that you need, grab all the header information so that it can poop out a make file, and then you can go ahead and make and make install. It feels a little wonky running sudo make install to install sudo, but you got to do it. You got to patch. Uh, and I would recommend you do this right away. 
Okay, now that that has configured, I can go ahead and run make, and I will and and sudo make install with that, and I'll whack that. It will go ahead and compile and install it into the proper directories for my system. So then the next time I run sudo tac tac version, I will no longer see 1.8.31 or whatever it was. Now I'm gonna be running on that 1.9.5p2, as we know, the patched version. So that's just a quick, all the commands you need to go ahead and patch, and then then you can trust that your machine is safe and secure. Do this, do it, patch, update, hotfix, it's gotta be done. Okay, now that command has finished, it has installed it. So if I were to clear my screen and if I were to run sudo tac tac version now, I will still see the 1.8.31, but keep in mind your terminal kind of has to be restarted. So the quick way to do this, just as a sanity check as you're working with it, you could just run bash tac c and then go ahead and sudo tac tac version. Now you'll see the output. Hey, you're running 1.9.5p2. If you were to spawn a new terminal, right, here I am in a new window, I'll bring that up to full screen. Obviously, a pseudo tac tac version in that context will tell me we are on the latest stable, up-to-date, and patched version of pseudo. Cool. All right, now that that's out of the way, let's get nerdy. Let's do a little deep dive with my good friend Caleb as to what this Qualys article and what all the news are all about with this bug and how it works. And we'll talk a little bit about how we could be fuzzing it or also trying to find this vulnerability on our own. He's still working through it, but we'll keep you up to date in case we find anything new. So roll the clip. All right, so uh, we're going to talk about the CV2021-3156. Uh, it's a heap overflow in pseudo. Uh, I have the actual Qualys is the company that released the uh, vulnerability initially today. I guess this, this article was posted yesterday. Um, and it's really cool because basically you can trigger the vulnerability really easily with a short command at your terminal. Um, and so it's cool to be able to see something like a heap overflow that you can just like show that it works right away um, from the terminal. Um, the actual exploitation of that is more complicated um, and they don't go over exactly how to do it, but probably for security reasons. They don't want to just release that before people have a chance to patch it. Yeah. Um, but there are some details out there about what they did to find it how they fuzzed that a little bit, and then a little bit of detail about the different routes they used for uh, actually exploiting it to get RCE. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, I just wanted to quickly go through kind of what the article talks about. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, obviously, um, but basically it affects pretty much any pseudo version since 2011. Yeah, yeah 2011. it just affects pseudo, um, <laughs> like, yeah. it does. It just, you know, uh, the patch was released, I believe, yesterday, the day before. Is that correct? Um, if I recall correctly, it probably says near somewhere. I think it was yesterday, the day before. Um, but, uh, yeah, so update your sudo if you haven't. Um, but it affects basically every single operating system that uses sudo. So if you're on Ubuntu, if you're on Debian, if you're on Fedora, if you're on Scent, whatever, uh, I'm on Arch, it affects me. Um, if you have sudo, the bug is there. Um, I guess we can actually start off by just showing it um, working, like showing it crashing, um, which is kind of a cool little thing. So if I go uh, sudo, uh, actually that, if I go- um, Could you zoom in a little bit more so it's obnoxious? Yeah. Sorry. Uh, no, you're fine. Um, is it edit sudo or sudo edit? I sudo edit, right. I think. Um, so sudo edit, and we'll go over why exactly it's sudo edit, not sudo in a second, but just like a, kind of a cool little start off, like this is it actually working. Um, so the fundamental bug is that it's not processing escaped characters correctly. So we give it an escape character, um, and then you can give it, and all reality, actually, you can give it other things. So uh, we give it a bunch of stuff for its buffer, and this all happens during the processing of the arguments. Um, so it doesn't matter what the arguments are, and it doesn't matter if you're in the pseudo pseudoers file, it doesn't matter what user you are, it is a bug in the pseudo binary itself prior to all of that happening. Um, so none of that matters, and you can see right here, um, it died, we had mallet corrupted top size, abort, blah, blah, blah. Um, basically what that means is we overflowed something in the heap, um, malloc later after we overflowed that, um, pseudo attempted to allocate something in the heap and malloc said wait a second this is all messed up like the the actual structures that malloc uses to track all of the data that you've allocated have now been corrupted and malloc 
basically killed the application because it said, I can't trust anything in memory anymore and we're gonna leave. Um, so that's just a quick, that is it working on my actual machine. I just haven't updated yet today. So that's my actual machine and it's working. Hey, uh, sorry, quick pivot. I just wanted to showcase if you were running that test or doing that check, now that we've patched it right, running that exact same command syntax using sudo edit and then tack s and denoting that you're gonna use an escape character, it will no longer cause that malloc choke. It'll simply tell you, hey, here's the actual usage of sudo edit and that is what you can end up using to kind of determine, hey, is your system vulnerable or are you currently patched or you want a good version? So that's that. Now we'll get back to the good stuff. Thanks. Um. So that's pretty cool that you can just test it or like see it working like that. Um, as far as what it actually, or why it actually works that way, um, basically uh, sudo does a bunch of processing. They end up taking all of your command line arguments in, which come into the application into the program as an array of strings. So every single argument you pass in is, is a string on its own. Um, and depending on the mode that sudo is in, it might actually combine all of those individual arguments back into one long string. The problem with that is that then you have issues of, okay, well, what if one argument had a space in it? What if one argument had this other special character and that kind of thing? In order to handle that, sudo takes all of the arguments individually and combines them together with spaces in the middle to make a normal string like you type in the shell. And then it has to go through and escape special characters like spaces. Um, when it does that converting to that and then converting back, if you had a lone backslash in there with nothing after it, it gets confused because it thought that was actually, it, it thought there was supposed to be another character after that. It thought you were trying to escape something. Like you would normally do maybe a backslash space as a specific example to this. If you did a backslash space, what that would mean is, hey, I don't wanna put a space as in separating two arguments. I wanna put an actual space in this current argument. Um, so it's looking for that next character. And what happens is sudo misinterprets the next character, which is actually the null terminator of that string oh. and misinterprets that and thinks that that is supposed to be an escaped character and then keeps processing things because it didn't notice the null terminator. Gotcha. That's what's happening there and causing that overflow. Um, and this article goes into some details about how you trigger it and why it's hard to get there. Um, it comes down to basically, um, let me find that exact block. Um, I believe it's this one. Um, so they check this pseudo mode and it has to pass this check in order to get to the part that does that uh, escape character processing. Um, in order to set all of those settings, there's no way to trigger that normally. Um, but what they realized was you could trigger that set of options because of some uh, some logic bugs in the process if you ran sudo edit. So sudo edit is actually the same binary as sudo. It's just a symlink. Huh. And what sudo does is it checks to see if argv0, so like the first argument, which normally is the name of the process that's running, it checks to see if that is sudo edit, and it does one thing if it's sudo edit, and does something else if it's sudo. They're both the same binary. Um, so when you run, and they also process arguments the same way. So when you run sudo edit, you're still running sudo, but it sets one specific flag that you needed. It doesn't reset another one that should have been reset. And then you, because they use the same argument processing, are allowed to pass tack s, which actually sets the last flag that you needed. That, that all relates back to these flags that they're talking about here. And I'm not going to go through every single code block they have here because that would be monotonous. Um, but that is basically why you have to run sudo edit. Um, so as you saw, I ran sudo edit tack s, which like I said, that tack s gives us that last flag that it needs to get into that block of code to process those arguments. After that, we don't really care what sudo edit is supposed to do. Um, it's going to crash before it gets there. Um, that's a really, really quick rundown of how it works. So once now that we have that like baseline of how we got here, at this point, it's just a buffer over, or it's just a yeah buffer overflow uh, in the heap. Um, we have to figure out how exactly we can use that. Heap exploits are traditionally uh, obnoxiously complicated. They make my head hurt. 
Um, but because <laughs> there's a lot of links, um, basically the heap, if you if you've never looked into it before, is kind of like basically a linked list. So every single uh, piece of memory that you allocate has a header at the beginning of it, and that header tells the the allocator or malloc is what you usually use. Um, it tells malloc and free how long the next block of memory is. So for every piece of memory you allocate, you have a header that says, hey, this is how long this block is. And the way it finds the next block is it just adds however much that size says it is to that pointer, and then you get to the next block. So it's a linked list in that way. Um, there's some other pieces in there that make it more complicated, like there are uh, special values that have to line up if the pointers for the backward references don't line up with the forward references, that gets all funky. Um, and so there's security checks in there that make it very difficult to exploit heap based buffer overflows. Um, but what's kind of interesting about this, and they go into it here, um, is that basically they went through and they said, okay, we have this heap exploit. What we would like to do is they wanted to reuse an old uh, uh, method of heap exploitation because they were like, oh, this is just a basic heap overflow. We could reuse this method and apply it here and maybe get code execution. Um, and they go into that, actually. It's interesting. I was talking with John a minute ago about this. The actual Qualys blog article um, stops here. So they talk about this and they say, hey, you know, um, after your arguments, the thing immediately following your arguments in memory ends up being your environment variables. Um, so you can actually continue the overflow through the environment variables, which is useful. Um, and so they give an example here where uh, they do a similar thing that I did, where they had the the one, two, three, whatever. Those those numbers and letters don't matter. Then after that happened, it then continued copying characters from the environment. So you see down here, um, you have your one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all this stuff that you had here. Where this slash is, it actually escaped the null character, and this dot is your null character. Um, and then you have your a, a equals, which is here, um, a, and you can actually insert null bytes into the buffer, so you can actually use null bytes, which is not always a case for buffer overflows. Um, you can actually insert null bytes with escape characters. So they showed that example here. They have a, a equals a, and then a null byte, and then b equals b, just like you see here. And so all the way down the line, um, you can continue that overflow through the environment variables. Um, this is where this article on Qualys actually ends. Interestingly, uh, this page from uh, PacketStorm Security has, from what I can tell, the same content in a little bit different of a format. Um, but, if, but if you look at the actual content, it appears to be the same um, as far as the description of the vulnerability and these code blocks and all these types of things. But when you get down to a similar part right after they do that same thing with this uh, overflowing with the environment that you see here, um, this article ends and packet security goes into some more detail about how they did their uh, fuzzing to find the actual or the specific way that they could leverage this vulnerability to gain code execution. Um, so it's kind of interesting. I like this article. It goes into some cool details. Um, they talk about how they wanted to use uh, basically part of uh, the locale. Um, they wanted to modify the locale, which allowed them to use that other thing I was talking about. So they mentioned uh, half dogs technique from this link, which you can go look up. Um, Had you done a, any digging on that one? Did you kind of make any sense of that? One? I haven't actually gone into that, to be honest with you. I had focused on their first result, which actually, from all the indications of this, seems like a much simpler way to do it if I can find the right parameters. Um, but they did it by accident, so finding those right parameters is going to be annoying. Um, I haven't looked into it, to be honest. Um, but they were apparently trying to replicate that. And it has something to do with set locale, and I haven't gotten all the way into the weeds on that yet. Um, moral of the story is that they developed this fuzzer that was going to fuzz the LC environment variable because they were doing stuff with the locale. Um, it was also going to fuzz the size of the user args buffer, which is basically the argument that you passed in. Um, and then it was going to overflow and the, the size of how much you were going to overflow into that. 
Um, pretty sounds pretty straightforward as far as fuzzing overflows go. Um, and then they ran that fuzzer. Uh, like they said, they weren't able to get the outcome they wanted because apparently the locale was forced for some reason is what they talk about here. It was always set to see instead of obeying what they were trying to set it to. Um, so their method wasn't working. However, in the output of all of their crashes, because they crashed pseudo a ton of times while they were fuzzing this, they found some interesting results. And I think the first one to me is the most interesting because it's just like, I don't want to say coincidence, but it's such a straightforward, like if you can get this, then like basically done. <laughs> um, they, during their fuzzing, they realized that at some point they accidentally overwrote an or a, uh, a function pointer. Um, not only did they accidentally overwrite a function pointer, but the function pointer they overwrote, all of the arguments that get passed to that function are valid arguments for execv. Oh. Um, what that means is if all they really have to do is instead of, in this case, um, they overwrote the function pointer with a bunch of A's, 41, 41, 41, 41, um, and that caused a crash. But if they control this, which they do because they send a bunch of A's, um, they could set this theoretically to the address of the exec VE function. The function that is supposed to be getting called is this get env, which they talk about here, what the actual arguments to that function are. Um, it ends up being the name of the environment variable, a pointer to a pointer for the value, my like pointer to a pointer to a pointer uh, for the value. Um, and then this closure thing that is supposed to be a callback. And they talk about those arguments and they actually line up really well with what execv is expecting. The name that gets passed in is an environment variable name, but if we were to create, this is the actual thing that gets passed in. And if we were to create an executable within our path that was named that, it doesn't matter where it is, just create it somewhere. And then we ran execve or forced this pseudo to run execve, it would run this binary. Even though we didn't create that, like we we didn't make that name, sudo was trying to call get env with that name. But if we made that executable in our path, that would work. Um, and then it talks about how these these values of these arguments happen to line up. Um, it's a pointer to a null pointer, which lines up with execv's uh, argv argument. And then the closure is actually a null pointer itself, which lines up with execv's environment pointer. Um, basically, you can you can pass an empty argv array and you can pass no environment and exec is fine with it, which okay. happens to be what this is doing. Um, so it's it's kind of like kind of like a fluke and I think it's really cool or I, yeah, I think it's really cool that it just kind of like lined up that way. Um, I spent this afternoon trying to find um, arguments that would end up with this crash. I was not successful. Um, I'm gonna keep playing with it. I, I wanted to uh, compile pseudo with debug symbols and then just start playing with the crash in GDB uh, and trying to look for the values that are actually in these hooks to see when I start overwriting them um, instead of blindly doing it like they did because that could either take a lot of time or end up with a lot of data that I have to look, to, look through and since I already kind of know the targeted location I'm looking for. Um, sadly, sudo was being a jerk and I could not get sudo to compile with debugging symbols. I don't know why, uh, but it refused to compile. Um, I did write a really bad fuzzer um, in like Python, uh, where did I put it? CVE that. Um, I don't even wanna, I don't even really wanna show it. It's real bad. <laughs> oh, it's open over here. Uh, yeah, it's. I mean, it's nothing crazy. I start a. I start a thread, um, reading K message, looking for the segmentation faults or general protection faults. Um, that basically K message is like D message, so you'll see a line in there for whenever a process has a segmentation fault or a general protection fault. Um, I grab those lines and record what the PID was for that process. Um, that's just running in another thread because K message never ends, so you can't just read all of K message. It's a special device file that never ends. Um, so I do that in another thread and I store that in a variable and then, uh, keyed by the pit of the process, the crash. And then I just go through a bunch of sizes of, uh, overflow to do. And I just wanted to see what the result would be. Um, the only result I ever got 
was that malloc error, um, which it could be for a lot of reasons. Um, I need to test more, and I really just need a, a debug copy of sudo so I can figure that out. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I can run it, but it's not interesting. It just says that it's you get a bunch of crashes, and it's trying a bunch of sizes. Um, yeah, that was really, really fast, and I talked really fast. <laughs> uh, what else did I go over? <laughs> um, are <laughs> you... About in, in here? Sorry. No, 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 continue. Uh, talk about other things they, they did in here. I was focusing on this one today. Um, I want to get into the other different methods that they may have used, but this article has some more information. Did this just, like, reload? Um, this article does have some more information about the different things they saw um, and how you could use it. Uh, oh, one thing I forgot to mention, the so doing that, overriding execve, uh, or overriding with execve, um, we don't actually have the address to execve. We have no memory leak from the process, which a lot of times you think about buffer overflow is like, oh, I need a memory leak because there's ASLR. Um, that's true, you do, but also you are assumed to already have local execution because you're running sudo. Um, and if you do, uh, you can read the symbols from sudoers.so, which is where you're actually getting execve from. Um, and so you know the offset for that, and you can do a partial overwrite of that function pointer, um, which effectively, uh, they talk about it in here, but you can't get an exact partial overwrite, but you get partial overwrite plus a little bit extra. Um, and I think it's only one byte that you compromise and it ends up being like, statistically you should get the right address like in 4,096 tries or something like that. Um, and so basically they say, you know, we don't have a leak. We don't actually know the address, but we can run it 5,000 times and it will probably succeed. You're just kind of brute forcing that last byte of ASLR, um, which I think is a perfectly fine, like. It might be noisy, but it would be cool to see it work. Right. Um, and that's the most straightforward initial go. So that's where I was trying to work at. Um, sorry, you started to say something and I cut you off. No, I was going to ask, do you mind showing us uh, how you were trying to compile sudo or kind of what that looks like when you're trying to get the debugging symbols and what you're, what, what wall you're running into? Um, I, I don't even remember. I can open up. Uh, sudo. Open. Um, they have like this thing you're supposed to run. Um, it's in scripts. Yeah. Um, so you don't just run configure, apparently. You run like make package, and I, it wasn't behaving for me. You're supposed to just be able to pass debug in. Um, what exactly it told me? Is there anything else I need to pass in there? Oh, I wanted to pass in all that stuff, but I won't for now. That should do it. And probably with my luck, it's going to work now that I'm sitting here saying it doesn't work. It's kind of what I was um, hoping that for. Should, <laughs> <laughs> that should produce a make file, and then you should just be able to run make and get a built copy of sudo. Um, it needs to be compiling something. I, I've never used this, whatever this make package thing is. I don't know if it's specific to sudo or not, but normally it's just like dot slash configure. Um, Warnings, I suppose. They're moving really fast. Um, yeah, so I get. What was this saying? It's the make package thinks it's trying to build an RPM file, which isn't right because I'm on Arch. Probably if I just did this from like a Debian machine where make package knows what to do because it mentions that wherever it is in your platform, you can platform use RPM or whatever. Uh, Probably if I did it on not Arch, it would probably work. <laughs> uh, but I didn't have a VM on hand when I was doing this a little bit ago. I can try it uh, on my machine. <laughs> if you want, go for it. Um, it's literally just like github.com slash sudo tag project, I think, slash sudo, you can clone it. Um, Maybe again, if you're comfortable with it, or if you're cool with it, we could. If we get any, if you get any other progress, we could do this again to showcase kind of what you've poured through. But sure, yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay, so that's all the conversation that I have for you so far. 
Um, obviously, yeah, we're still kind of tinkering with this. We're still kind of playing with it. I know Caleb's going to spin up a virtual machine to see if he can get maybe pseudo compiled with the bugging symbols. I've tried to download it on my machine and I'm tinkering with it as well. There's no way I'm actually going to get anywhere with it, but if anything, I can, uh, enable and encourage some other folks. And I hope to try to do so. Cause look, this is what it's all about. Uh, if we're seeing new bugs, new flaws, new vulnerabilities, then it kind of takes a village, right? It's the whole community playing in concert. Everyone kind of just kind of jumping in to learn about this thing, see how we can make it better, see how we can improve it and see how we can learn from it and just getting everyone in the know, just, uh, just, I don't know, spreading the knowledge. So that's what this video was all about. Uh, I hope you enjoyed that safari ride through some pseudo stuff, but patch your systems. I can't say it enough. Hopefully that thing, that segment at the beginning of this video helped out and, uh, we'll do this soon. If we get any updates for you, we'll, we'll hopefully be able to bring that to you just as well, but please, please jump in as well. You know, you should be having just the same fun that we are and, uh, patch. I can't say it enough. Go patch. Thanks so much, everybody. I'll see you in the next video. Love you. Take care.